good evening and uh, welcome to the <clears throat> final talk of the Savita College of Architecture Design Forum. It began with uh, President Habib Khan and then we had uh, architect Rajiv Katpalya was with us today. On the earlier day, we had Professor Doshi and Professor Chaya with the Jerusalem School of Architecture, uh, which was really the initiation of this design forum. We are honored to have Professor Doshi in our midst today, a rare occasion, Sonke and several other architects. When Jeremy Smith has joined us from New Zealand, I think it's two in the night, and we, we expect to have a few more architects from Paris, Mirto and a few others, and from Italy joining us soon. Uh, <clears throat> so architect Peter Rich, Peter Rich, really honored to have you here, and Jonathan Noble, uh, honored to have you here. Uh, the context, uh, a dialogue on the book, the architecture of Peter Rich conversations with Africa. But more importantly, uh, in our conversations, we thought that it may be better next month to really have a more prolonged uh, workshop over the month, very similar to what we just had with the Jerusalem School of Architecture. And I'm grateful to the generosity of Peter Rich and Jonathan Nobel uh, in collaboration with our Savita College of Architecture and with the support of the council to unfold this workshop, which we will have next month. Those interested could always write to us. And so this conversation really kind of looks at what may happen in that workshop and at the same time attempts to uh, excavate Jonathan Noble's own research uh, into the work of Peter Rich, the evolution of a certain framework and uh, a deeper understanding of the context in Africa. And I think that's what we look forward to. I would now invite uh, <clears throat> Priyanka, a faculty at a college, to introduce the two speakers, Peter Rich and Jonathan. And then Jonathan, I would assume, has a small presentation of about 20 slides over which this dialogue will unfold. And that I would leave to Jonathan, and then we open the floor to everyone participate. So thank you again, Peter, and thank you, Jonathan. And I thank all the architects who come in today uh, and enriching our program today. Uh, the program is going to be recorded. We are transcribing it, and the text of the transcription will be again available open source uh, and move into studios in different schools of architecture. And that's been the process that we've followed. So we look forward to a very <clears throat> insightful conversation. And of course, the insights of Professor Balakrishnan Doshi, I repeat again, we're deeply honored and to have him with us today. Thank you. Priyanka, would you introduce the speakers and then maybe Jonathan can take over. Good evening, one and all, and a warm welcome to the Design Forum SCAD 2021. Uh, I'm happy to have a, a esteemed guest list that we have here with uh, architect Peter Ridge, Professor Jonathan Noble, Professor Bibi Doshi, uh, Professor Rajiv Patpalia, architect Rajiv Patpalia, architect Jeremy Smith, and, and a lot of more, many others. So I'd like to go down to introducing our guests for the evening. We have architect Peter Rich, who is perhaps one of the most significant architects in South Africa. He extensively documented the indigenous African settlements during the apartheid in the 1970s. His work came in international focus when his documentation and analytical sketches were made public. His architecture, contemporary in its idea, is built on years of research and exposure. His projects and his work within had deep social implications and were ins instrumental in resurrection of the South African spirit. Architect Peter travels extensively and settles in between in Johannesburg from where he practices. We have more about architect Peter Rich um, on our SCAD um, Instagram profile where you could actually visit him so that you can read a lot more about the work that he has and the, in the workshops that he has conducted with us. It's available on the Instagram profile SCAD underscore architecture. 
a few words about our next guest that is Professor Jonathan Noble. Professor Jonathan Noble currently serves as the head of department in architecture at the University of the Free State. He lectures in creative research and architectural design and convenes the PhD in architecture with specialization in design program at the University of Free State. Uh, Professor Jonathan holds a BR and MR by independent research, both from the University of the Wat Witwater Strand, a PhD from the Bartlett School of Architecture, University College, London, and is author of the books, African Identity in Post-Apartheid Public Architecture, White Skin, Black Mass, published by Ashgate in 2011, and The Architecture of Peter Rich, a conversation with Africa, published by Lund Humphreys in 2020. I'd like now like to um, hand over the screen to Professor Jonathan Noble so we can hear about his work and then we can have our dialogue. Good evening, sir, and welcome. Yes, good evening to you all. And uh, it's really such a, a lovely privilege and an honor to be able to uh, be here and to uh, talk to everyone. And, you know, um, to have your work published in the form of a book as an academic, I don't know, that is a, a truly thrilling and wonderful moment. And um, I, uh, this book on the work of Peter Rich, it came out of five years of research. So it was a lot of work that went into it. And um, I think the title of the book is significant. The architecture of Peter Rich, obviously, that's what the book's about. And then the second title, Conversations with Africa, because um, some of the most important questions that we face in our world and uh, questions that we ask ourselves, who we are, where we come from, how we belong, where we're going, these are things that are not always easy to answer because often there are no clear answers. And when artistic matters that include architecture get involved in questions of who we are and where we belong, it's an open-ended question. And that's why conversations are required. And um, I think architecture is very uh, interestingly positioned because conversations occur in the making of architecture. And uh, those conversations are very important. And it seems to me that Peter's work has involved a life's long conversation, a listening, a drawing, a trying to understand and an engaging in very specific contexts. Um, and his architecture evolves out of all of that. So I thought that was a, a, a very important uh, title uh, for the book. And uh, really this book does carry on from work I'd done earlier in my previous book, which was much more specific. It was looking at um, issues that emerged early in the post-apartheid period, looking at public buildings where architects were looking for some sort of a new expression and, and, and uh, a, a need to, to consider pre-colonial histories and to look deep into that sense of who are we and how do and how do we imagine ourselves? And public buildings can achieve this. Um, so my book, book on Peter Rich is definitely a continuity on that uh, line of research. And I think um, the next thing I wanted to say is why Peter? Why did I choose to write about Peter? I think it's very important to choose your topics as an author. Um, there has to be some authenticity in what you write and how you write. You can't just write about anything. Um, so I chose Peter because, well, number one, uh, he taught me at architecture school and taught me many of the things I know. So that's a very good starting point. And then secondly, I worked for him uh, as a young architect. And I think that gave me huge insights into his way of thinking, his working method, uh, which I believe served me well. But also, I think Peter is a very unique and unusual architect. And here in South Africa, I think he stands out. 
He's very quirky. And um, for me, that was, that was important. In the book, I used this image. I believe there's a little bit of delay uh, for me when I advance images. Uh, gosh, doesn't seem to be coming through. Um, Nandan, the image isn't advancing. Should I maybe try again? You could uh, share the screen again. Okay, let me try that. Sorry, folks. I'm just going to try share the screen again. Okay. So I'm going to uh, Okay. All right. Does that now come up? Try the next one. Okay. So now we're going to go to full screen. Sorry, folks, and we just did a dry run a few minutes ago, and um, everything worked perfectly well. Ah, looks like we're back in the game. Okay, so um, I love this, this photo we put in the book of Peter. He's seen here in the landscape, walking away from Mapungubwe, and this was really tried to, to capture some, some uh, essential aspect about him, that he's this very creative, restless soul. He's always moving on. He's always going on to his next project. He doesn't like to repeat himself. And that's another reason why I wanted to write about Peter. I think he's a very um, unique character. Um, I wanted to say a few things about researching, research methods, ways of working, ways of thinking. And the first thing I want to say is that the book evolved out of extensive interviews with Peter. You see him here in his sitting room and I'm, I'm talking to him. And I used to script questions and call him up and go visit and uh, we would have a conversation. And of course the conversation would go, would go in its own direction. And so we just allowed it to mature the way it wanted to. And uh, we recorded it and I had all those interviews transcribed. I did 20 hours of interviews with Peter and another 20 hours with other people who had been involved in his projects. And uh, we actually explored concepts and, and ways of thinking about his work together. And this was a very, very productive mode of, um, mode of research. And then of course, uh, visiting the buildings, that's very important. It's very important to visit architecture, to wander aimlessly, uh, to find those special places in a building that talk to you directly, to drink in the atmosphere and to imagine. And I, I always have paper with me and I, I'm just writing ideas down and I'm imagining things and I'm looking for, I'm looking for little narrative threads. I'm looking for little uh, details or spaces that I know I can describe in my book and it can open the conversation about the architecture. So we did extensive tours and I put this humorous shot in. Uh, we crossed the Tropic of Capricorn. Uh, we went north of Capricorn, but you can see they got the sign wrong. It's, it says Capricorn. So we actually had to stop the car and get out. And um, you'll see me there with the hat and uh, Peter's in the middle. And in black is our photographer, Barry Goldman. And uh, we made extensive trips. And the photography is really important. We took original photographs. 
and all three of us entered the conversation on what was the right shot. Getting the right shot is really important because at the end of the day, the images set up the narrative and I spent lots of time preparing the, the visual sequence that led through the book and the writing was very much tied to the visual sequence. I really tried to get the visuals and the, and the words to intertwine. And that was one of my key uh, uh, considerations. In, in Jonathan, at that book. point, if I could just comment, you were like a yeah. script writer, um, you know, scripting a movie because there's a, there's, there's a narrative. It starts off and concludes the book. And it's quite nice because lay people enjoy reading the book because of that because it's a story that unfolds. And I think you've been very gifted in that story. And I also want to add, when we had the interviews, you also got inside my head where I was on the sabbatical when I did this alteration to our house and I was doing the garden. You know, who were my teachers? They were the Smithsons. They were into ordinariness and light. It was at the same time that Venturi came out with complexity and contradiction. I was into Schindler and I was into... Um, uh, Lewis in terms of their ideas on space and a space architecture and all of those you uncovered all of those and even though I might not have given due credit to one of those influences you pointed out how it was an influence because we see what we want to see and we make it our own and in the reinterpretation it's important and I what I want to add is what came out of this is the hybrid nature in which an architect works because we've got this Eurocentric influence we've got the influence we're exploring locally um, we've got what occupies our headspace intellectually at one point in time which is fertilized by teaching and then there's an interaction and then how we reinterpret this and give it symbolic meaning in its time and place is what makes it relevant um, um, to its time and place. And it's, it's got the whole autobiography that comes with it. And if you've got drawing as a thinking tool, you can add that to the way you understand the autobiography because you can access it. It's not just in the written word or in the oral tradition. Yes, and I think... Peter and I, we had so much fun. Well, you can see we're having fun here on our road trip. Um, and we had so much fun in these interviews. It was really brilliant. And one of the things I'm always uh, searching for is I'm trying to probe the design process. I'm trying to understand what was the first sketch? What was the model? What was the first idea? And did that incur another? Because if you follow the process, you start to understand the thinking. You don't, necessarily, you don't necessarily have to write it that way, but it's a very important, I believe a very important research tool to understand what's deep in the architecture. And then linked to this was drawings. So a, a really remarkable thing is the fact that Peter did special drawings for the book. This is a completely new drawing and he did it because we had a conversation together and we discovered something about his house and I told Peter, I want to write about that. And he, he agreed to make a, a special drawing. He, Peter also redrew quite a few of the plans to make them more beautiful for publication. So we actually used drawing as a, as, as an, as a thinking tool in, in crafting the narrative. Not only that, I think Pancho Geddish, who was my mentor, you know, and was described by Peter Cook as one of the most creative people he's ever met. Um, Pancho would see the opportunity at redoing a drawing as a fantastic opportunity um, to, to, to do another iteration and improve what you were, were doing. Okay. Yeah. And um, Peter loves, he loves drawing. <laughs> it's very time consuming, but he loves it. And, and, That's my and I, also, time. I also started drawing. I was doing lots of drawings of his, of his building, studying them through sketches and, Trying that also gave me enormous insight into the work. So I think that um, maybe I, I just wanted to make a few points about uh, some of the unique unique qualities of of Peter's work, and we've already touched on an important one here, and that is that Peter uses drawing extensively uh, in his way of thinking and in his way of developing architecture. And you know, in architecture schools around the world. Theory has become a big thing. And I'm not opposed to that because I teach theory myself and I love it. But um, sometimes 
theory becomes like this thing that, like a dog that chases its own tail and theory chases theory and it doesn't engage with the reality that is architecture. And that's sad. And I feel that actually withdrawing, we've got this sort of quasi theoretical discourse that's already embedded in architecture. And it's so close to us, we don't always think of it as being important. So I think there's at least three ways in which Peters draws. Firstly, he draws in a, a descriptive way. So these are from some of his early studies of Enderbelly settlements. And um, Peter went and he measured up these homesteads and he drew them uh, in, in, it's in, now the, 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 if you look at the cosmic order in the circular house, which is a place for shelter and stories, how when it was part of the semicircle or the circular bigger settlement, when due to wars and that it got dislocated and was isolated, you can see it restlessly searching for how it in no longer in the in the piece of cake form that goes around a circle, which is the cattle bar, was trying to come to terms with the rectilinear, but the rectilinear was informed by the body, by the axis, by the axiality, by duality, and, and they had no trouble in that transition. Yeah, and, and it's, these are sort of, they're descriptive, they're almost scientific drawings, if you will. Um, and just think how important this is, because vernacular architecture is never drawn, really. It evolves, it belongs to evolution. Drawing belongs to design. In, in the more contemporary sense. And, and design and evolution, they're on different time zones. You know, the one's thought on paper, the other evolves through time. And what these descriptive drawings do is they transfer, they, they create a connection between two time zones, those of designerly thinking and evolutionary logic. And so it's actually a profound thing to draw uh, the vernacular. In fact, to draw any context. Tantra said to me, um, go on your own. Don't take art historians. Don't take anthropologists. Don't take archaeologists. They'll steal your work and muddy the waters. Just go and observe how people create architecture as a backdrop to ritual practice, how they absorb it into their life. Draw the plan. Draw the sections. Learn about scale and do the three Ds. And just do that. So he provided that discipline and build a relationship with the people so that you get to actually understand who they are and they respect who you are. And don't go as the professor. Don't go as the, as the architect. You go, you go, you're going to humbly learn from them. Thank you. Okay. And then the, the, the second way in which I think Peter draws is he draws in this poetic way. And this way is about drinking in an atmosphere. It's about imagination. It's about immersing your body into a very specific space, tuning yourself like you tune a guitar, tuning yourself to an environment and feeling. I mean, this drawing is unbelievable. It's full of the most visceral, incredible feelings. I believe it is in the Jean, Jean Peur temple in, in India, and it's a drawing of the interior. It's about light, it's about atmosphere and spirituality. And I think- North of Hyderabad, Varangal, and I was so overcome by the thickness of prayer in the space that I'm, I'm actually drawing the same thing from different positions. Um, and it had to do with the sacredness of light, but you actually felt the thickness of prayer and, and the presence of something without knowing that two, two thirds of that lingam is, 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 is not seen and without knowing necessarily the ritual practice, but the light that, that hung over it um, and it was going into sanctity. And we all know that, you know, Palasma and, 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 the, dark, and the darkness mentioned by Doshi of that there's too much light in architecture. When you go into the sacred, you want the half light. And I think that's what's fantastic about um, uh, uh, Doshi's architecture and the and the London University we saw of Rajiv yesterday that there is that void and in that void there's sacredness and um, and yes uh, you know you overcome with emotion you can write about it but you can also draw it absolutely and then the, I think the third way in which Peter draws is in this analogical way 
Uh, this is a new drawing, doesn't feature in the book, and I'm sure Peter will talk to it. But in, this in the space of this drawing, you've got body parts, you've got animals, you've got nature, you've got architecture, you've got elements of architecture like towers, and everything can transform into anything else. So a hand can become a tower, or it could become a fish, or a fish could become the motion in a landscape. And it's about this incredible imagination that can connect and breach between different realms of human imagination. Um, I think this is the mental space. You know, Le yeah. Corbusier taught us how he did mythological drawings. They weren't rep directly representational, but they were. Exp this is the view from our bedroom window. It's framed by an arch, which is the two chimneys, and and um, and it's very symbolic because central. It's got a. It's got a. a, a, a a Chinese bowl, which we float lilies in at our front door, which is a sort of anniversary present. And then we've got central, we've got a, the one bit of nature that you've got is the, is the glorious aloe, which is about five meters tall that has this candelabra on it. But then that is flanked by um, my nose and my wife's nose. And behind us is a panel because it's it's actually a hero's relationship to a shaman who was Jackson Hulungwani, whose lot of his sculptures I own. And the fish was a metaphor for swimming forward. My wife and I are both Pisceans, so the fish are swimming in opposite directions. And there's God in the darkness holding the ball, which is actually a sculpture that I own, which is almost Romanesque. Okay, God holding the world. Okay. And then as you move up, there's the angel Gabriel moving down. Um, and although I was, you know, I was born a Christian, I've become many other things. And then there's the hands that of the sculptures that the hand that receives, that holds and then gives, which are symbolic representations, which were by this fantastic shaman who we found that he's Christian. He, 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 he took on a landscape that he is doing the same time that I did this in the late 70s, early 80s of our site. And uh, it was a palimpsest, as ours was a palimpsest. And I'm actually having that conversation with him. And then you've got, you've got the sun god Ra at the top, because so about 50 religions in the world come from the sun god at Ra, including the, the, the Christian faith, the 25th of December, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then there's the cattle culture of Africa. And then from the top, we, we look at mountains that are a, a thousand times older than the Himalayas. And then I've actually built this platform where I can go up and talk to Doshi and the the um, and face um, the temple of the sun sun in Gujarat and talk to the goddess of architecture when I want a problem solved so it's actually a mental map of paying homage to my relationship with Jackson and I think that's nice to pause and actually do that and it's very composed and very ordered I'd love to take it to the next level where it deconstructs the way Corp starts deconstructing. But the one thing needs to the other. Yeah. Thank you. So I, I think that Peter draws in these different ways, in this um, descriptive way, in this poetic way, and in this analogical way. And, um, you know, that, 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 that creates layers of thought. And architecture needs that because architecture has to talk to different uh, aspects and qualities of our human life. And um, I think this is uh, a really uh, interesting thing. There's other reasons, there's, uh, there's other um, things that are unique about Peter's work. I mean, I think it's often it's tough, it's bold, it's open. Um, it merges from the everyday um, uh, and, and it has spiritual moments. And um, the next point I just wanted to touch on is what inf has influenced Peter. And obviously um, the vernacular has had a, a huge influence on his work and learning from the genius of the ordinary and the everyday is another very big influence on his work. But also one can say the, um, the, the vestige of modernity, our modern culture and um, his own persona, because he's uh, quite a quirky, uh, interesting, unusual guy. And that's what makes his 
architecture interesting. He mixes his, his persona with his observations. So it's never merely uh, a serious a rendition of something that's given. It comes out as Peter's version of it. And he's a very out of the box kind of a guy. And I think that's what make, uh, makes his architecture fresh, but also with depth and resonance. It's and, that tension. Um, Le Corbusier was the mother's milk. Remember, we have some of the most profound examples of modernism in South Africa. In fact, a group of architects went from Joburg to see Corb. And in his first edition of Earth Complete, he writes a letter to them because he can't believe that in the southern tip of Africa, there's work. But they came from Central Europe and suddenly isolated with the right clients, managed to actually do an unbelievable flowering of their interpretations of that whole modernist ethic pre and post Bauhaus. And so that, that was a critical part of our, our upbringing, the, the almost imperative of that, um, which, um, you know, we, we were very well schooled in and had wonderful examples. In fact, the Denston Court, which was demolished by Skidmore Owens and Merrill to build a 50 story concrete tower in Johannesburg, the, the columns of that were shown to Corbin. They became the columns of the Unité de Habitation. Mm. Okay, and the architects were predominantly Jewish and they were predominantly Jewish clients like so much of the canonical works of Europe. But removed from Central Europe, removed from the center, there was a freshness and, and, and they, could, they could really grapple with things. So that's another consciousness that was around. And that's what you did, Jonathan. You, took, you gained insights into the consciousness and headspace of where you were at those different points in time which are very important to have a look at. Thank you. So um, this slide just talks to the fact that what we're actually uh, doing today was intended as a bit of a teaser because uh, we've got these four sessions coming up, um, which I obviously feel honored about uh, being able to present them to a broader audience. It's really wonderful. We're hoping that there will be a fair number of architecture students who will tune into this. So we're gonna be talking about vernacular translations, which is really um, the second and third chapter in my book and Peter Zenderbele studies and how in his house, he developed a, um, a language, a spatial language. And then the next talk is gonna be on the implied diagonal and the round plan and how uh, that theme develops over a series of buildings in his early work. And then the third session is really on chapter five, which is looking at Peter's social projects, initially rural and then later urban, uh, coming in on Mandela's yard in Alexander Township. And then the last session is on the more recent organic work, obviously kicking off with Mapungubwe and then into uh, work that he's done in China and Africa. So really for the rest of the talk, we just thought it'd be nice to give you a little teaser on what, are the, on what those four conversations are about, um, just to extract some, some, some key ideas. And so talking about the end of Bailey and the vernacular, I, I, I had to start with this um, beautiful apron, um, an end Bailey apron. And if we look at this, um, this piece, we just notice an incredible geometric sophistication. I mean, to start with, to make beadwork, you need a grid because you, you, you're stringing and you're putting grids. So you've got this, this architectural grid. And then there are these figures. I think there's two things to say about this. As a geometry, you've got all these very subtle plays of symmetry, of asymmetry, it's there, you may not notice it, but when you look more carefully, you notice there's asymmetric positioning of color. And then the, 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 the duality of left and right uh, versus the symmetry, which is uh, uh, with, with a, a stable center and two sides. And then the, these diagonal tensions that develop in this figure uh, where they pull out from the middle or they pull back into the center, depending on how you see it, and also sort of a flipping. So you see the three figures in the one triangle or the three in the other. 
So there's very sophisticated and then geometry. Then there's the rectilinear geometry of how you organize the canvas vertically and horizontally. You know, it's the same lessons you get when you're actually looking at a facade done by Palladio, for instance. And the anthropomorphism, the fact that the house yeah. is also a person and the yeah. two windows are an eye and the roof. And then the two things on the side are the ceremonial orbs, which um, they look at the power of power lines that exist in the landscape and they become ceremonial bombs because the association with power and they also go and see public buildings and then their public buildings become vestiges on the on the on the actual apron and if you look at the gestalt imagery i mean it's as sophisticated as all the ideas that they were working with in the bauhaus you know this could have been oscar schlemmer you know yeah. It's, so where do you, you know, we, we've tended to make this folk art. I don't buy the folk art thing. This is this is exactly the same, and 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 at a, at an equal level to 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 those those other Westerners who we've given glory to. In fact, half the time they were looking at this over their shoulder to get inspired. And there's nothing wrong with uh, that. It's what we do. Now, Peter, jump to my second point there, which was actually the iconography. And how uh, a building becomes a person, and a person is in a building, and it's like this ambiguous figure that 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 toys in between. So um, at Westridge, uh, we want to talk about how, um, which is Peter's own home, and what's significant about it is that it he st it started quite a few years ago. I forget the exact date, but um, ever since he acquired the house, and still to this day, he's building. So this house has continued throughout his career as an architect. I believe just about every idea that Peter has, you can find in his house. So here, he really develops his spatial language. And all those things we were talking about in the Ender Bailey beadwork, you can actually see it in the plan of this house. These very clever and subtle plays of geometry, and especially the diagonal emphasis, which creates this tension. And it creates it, drama. The original house was an object. And we've deconstructed the object because by looking at the underbelly, the underbelly, Africans don't view a house as an object. They view it as the greater area and the labyrinth of home is just part of that greater area. So it's a different way. It's, it's a different way of looking. So what one's done is through the garages on the side, through in the old driveway, putting a cottage, you define a main forecourt and then a series of side entrance courts. And then you, so you're all, even when you pull diagonal extensions out, you're starting to define meaningful outdoor space, which you can respond to through the seasons. And also because you're due north, when the equinoxes happen, the sun shines from the west in the afternoon right through the house and illuminates the stone wall that's in the interest. And you're also playing with the inside becoming the outside, the outside. So it becomes this dense and meaningful indoor and outdoor spatial weave. And you'll see Yohani Palazma picked up that later on, the rigorous working through with the, the basic underlying rectilinear geometries that underpin the geometry without it being re, without geometry ever throttling you. By understanding that, you start getting that that weave of geometries that interact with indoor and outdoor. So it becomes layered and it becomes subliminal, but it becomes the classical strength that underpins the fact that when you break the rules, it still holds its own. Right. So, um, and then this is just, a, I just included this shot as a photograph of the interior. Um, and this one was to point out that uh, the other really important thing in this house is Peter's uh, love of Adolf Lewis and his concept of the room, which is this idea that you have different rooms that are, are contained, but they allowed there's a spatial flow. So you've got this flow of space that connects between discrete containers of space. And really this building is a, re this house is a remarkable layering of lessons learned from the, the vernacular with lessons learned from modernity. And ordinarily you would say they can't talk to each other, but when you come to this house, it's as if they were made for each other. And it's this but also Lewis, said, Lewis taught us Lewis taught us that you, you know, for him, 
you didn't have to show how something was made or be honest about it. You could also, you're also creating theater. So when the staircase wraps around, the central rooms becomes like an edicule and the dining room table is just below the double bed that's upstairs on axis. And when you're in the kitchen, you can see who's at the front door. And actually it has to do with architectural promenade because it's actually facing the sun. So you, you're actually wrestling with these, these two wonderful ideas and you've got beautiful architects like Schindler and Lewis influencing you with space. But what's the real lesson that I had to learn was that the soffit that structures the space is so important, the ceiling. Okay. And I didn't have the chance to go into the ground to change level like, like Lewis does. So I had to change levels in, in, in the volumes of, of the, um, the roof plane. And then, of course, there's also John Soane of how you enter light in. So, you know, you, it's very important to have architectural history because you pull on this thing and then you and then you see how you can utilize those beautiful ideas. Brilliant. So we thought that was a, a, a nice way of explaining some of the key thoughts and lines of, 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 of investigation that will be in that first that first session, um, looking at the the vernacular traditions and also the traditions of modernity and how they can they can actually talk to each other and um, and then uh, the next session is on the implied diagonal which as you have seen is an important thing that comes in peter's house and whereas the the previous chapter on westridge the ha peter's house it was a study of one building so it's a very deep study of one building and all the ideas in it this chapter, which is the next one, is a, is a horizontal study. And I, I was very keen to do that, to take this idea of the diagonal and then show how Peter did a series of buildings where he toys with this idea and realizes it in a new context, in a new way. So this on the screen here, this was actually my drawing, trying to understand how Peter started with quite a pure notion of the the diagonal within the grid. And then in a series of moves, he explores the grid with respect to the diagonal in a, in a more and more and more subtle way. And in the later buildings, you, you've, you've always got that underlying uh, order and symmetry, but things start shifting and moving off. And it becomes this dance within a geometric language. And that's what this chapter is, is, is really all about. Um, so the, rec I want the, to rec the rectilinear geometry is so important to understand. And, when you, and it's interesting that here you see a shift in the geometry uh, from the top one, which is, which is very um, axial. It takes very little shift to, to delve into the the outcome of complexity. And I think there needs to be a series of lectures. I've discussed this with Kate Dungawala on how architecture needs order, but you need to know when to break the order and when to stop breaking the order. And maybe we can have a whole series just on that where we can take buildings. I mean, yesterday with Rajiv, it was a, it was a wonderful example of, 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 of just that with the Nalanda University. Okay, sorry, John, yeah. I didn't interrupt. No, not at all. It's it's exactly on point. And I mean, and these two parties, if we can use that French, wonderful French word, um, are a brother-sister building. The top is the Kemp House, the bottom is the Kennedy House, and they were built both from wood in a similar part of South Africa at the coast. And um, But the first one on top is a very pure concept, and it's these two squares, the, the top square is actually a courtyard. It's this very distilled, beautiful outdoor space that is held. And the square on the bottom is the main um, living space. And it's just the conversation between those two squares with these diagonals that lead out into the, into the landscape. And then the next house, the Kennedy house, Peter takes, in a sense, the same concept, I believe, uh, but he shifts the squares and they overlap and they share geometry. And there's a very magical moment right in the middle where they, where four columns hold the center between these two shifted geometries. 
And then the whole drama unfolds with these diagonals, one shooting off in this way, the other shooting off in that way. And it's a kind of but more then, subtle way of doing camp. They're intentional because in this case, it's like it, it, it focuses down on a beautiful coastline, which, which it frames the view of. And it descends down to, to capture that alive. That's what I believe we do in architecture. We capture views alive. So we had to put in just some photographs. This is of the Kennedy, of the Kemp House, the first one, with this very still, pure, distilled geometry, and this center, which is actually a courtyard, um, with a wraparound uh, a, a corridor. Uh, and then the, the the second one, the Kennedy House, uh, with this 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 interior that steps down the terrain and these incredible diagonal lines that cut across your motion, leading right out into the landscape, down a ravine, over a river, onto the ocean. Uh, and it's a one bedroom house, it, but its footprint had to be contained. It was part of the rule, but you can sleep 11 people. But what's important is in the construction, I started looking at Raymond's work um, in Japan and in, in, and in India. And that's why I exposed these members because the rhythm of the members, it almost needed a double construct, are very important to how you experience that space and how you frame it. So you start actually, um, it, it wasn't my first timber house, so I could actually be more adventurous with it. Yeah, so that's our second uh, 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 conversation. It's about how these uh, very clear ideas actually evolve and get complexified and develop across a, bo a body of work then the third and because one... you have this in because you have this indoor outdoor relationship of how buildings detach can meaningfully make space and you've got this 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 also this wonderful predilection for exploring interior space this this weave comes together and it has to do with making village it, it it's it's what doshi does in his work and it's what charles career does in his work because it actually the spaces between and it's got to do with Tightness. A lot of urban planning today is there's too much residual space. There isn't enough tightness. And I think when you've been in Africa and India, you understand the value of the alleyway. You understand the, the tartan grid. You understand the, that these differences in scale, that you don't need this big, enormous public space always. Okay. Right. And so then the third, the third conversation we want to have is on uh, Peter's social architecture. And um, the earlier projects were in rural areas, very, if, if you might say, very humble projects, working with very simple materials, uh, quite rustic and raw, uh, but containing a lot of the ideas that Peter has already developed. His, his, uh, in, his, geometri his geometric language is there and very elegant, beautiful detailing that lifts these simple structures and makes them wonderful architecture. But ultimately, this, this line of buildings leads up to um, his big building in Alexander Township. And Alexander Township in Johannesburg is one hell of a tough, tough area. Um, and I think what's remarkable about Peter's uh, building here in Alexander is that um, he doesn't uh, romanticize the poverty on the one hand and on the other hand he doesn't merely ignore it or overlook it but rather he looks into it and he actually studies it and tries to understand it and he tries to see the textures the informality the unique qualities of Alexander and it is what I would like to call a dirty urbanism it's a dirty urbanism but it's a vibrant urbanism and it contains incredible lessons for architecture. So uh, this is just a, a, an incredible photograph that Barry took. And, um, and then Peter, he, he really studied this quarter. It's where Nelson Mandela, it was his first home in Johannesburg as, as a young lawyer. And so a, a, a memorial project uh, developed around this. Um, and, and, and Peter studied this quarter in the city and made these drawings, trying to understand the kind of patchwork 
of the, the courtyards and the architecture and the major routes and the minor routes and the, the inner workings of this urbanity and his, his and if, building. If you go in, if you go in there, um, I went in with a measuring tape. It was before we had lasers. And, um, and I, the children and the grannies and the mothers helped me measure up. So you become their friends. So they invite you in, you have tea, and then you document their washing line. You document, you actually document the ingenious way in which they, within a 75 square meter house, create space and privacy. And, um, and it's a series of courtyards, 10 families a courtyard, which was a wonderful um, model that went right through Africa and the Middle East at one stage. You don't find it much anymore. So um, I learned so much. And actually, the negative space became the building, which we did opposite. So, this, then, you know, you actually, you end, there end it up, is. Actually, there it is. And it's not about form at all. In fact, it's this open order. It's this jungle gym that you erect, which then un in, unskilled labor can then fill in. But it's, 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 it's a gateway building. It's a building that deals with past, present, and future. It's not aloof. It respects the, 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 the squatter shack scale, but and yet it's dignified. It's got stone bases to it. And it's got an underlying classicism that's been rigorously worked at, which actually gives it its, it's like a, you know, when you, when you go to Pakistan and you actually see the beautiful faces of women who cheekbones come from the Persians. It's, I'm talking about a genetic thing that comes through. It's, it's got to do with the way it's proportioned. Their faces are proportioned. Or Indian women, who are some of the most beautiful in the world, it has to do with their facial structure. And it comes through the DNA. So you're looking for that DNA, and yet you're dealing with urban scavengers who throw away, they use old architectural boards and things to make their houses. And you've got rural people coming through who still have their skill. So how do you mediate that? And it was a wonderful journey of doing it through just getting involved. That's it. You just embrace life and get involved and be curious. And the building has the right duality because on the one hand it flies over and it's an aspirational symbol. It speaks of the future. On the other hand, it, it really touches the ground and, it, and, it, and it, it's embedded in that dirty urbanism. And, 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 and but also uh, lifts it with just the right degree of, of, public, of public stature and uh, creating safe space. And it really creates a, a center for the, for the town where there was none. Um, certainly not. I want, I, want to, I want to run an international workshop where this building can grow arms at first floor level. And then eventually the, 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 the squatters who live in shacks, we can actually provide urban housing for them. And they've got this as an amenity and it starts touches, touching on the urban ideas that the Smithsons had. So you refer back to your mentors and as homage to them, you grow. Wonderful. So the, the last conversation is on the, the organic work that came in later uh, for Peter. And um, yeah. in the book, I tried to explain how that came along. Don't want to get into that now, but uh, I'm sure people know his project for Mapungubwe. It is maybe the piece that Peter's best known for. And really this building is, is got to do with landscape. It's got to do with the textures of the landscape. It's this really tough, robust building that grows out of a harsh, tough landscape. Um, but it's also got to do with structure, you know, uh, because it was built from these, um, uh, built with these timbral vaults. It's a very old tradition of building. And the tiles were taken, were hand, it's actually hand pressed soil that was taken from the ground. So in a sense, not only is the building of the earth uh, uh, architecturally, but physically as a structure, it's built from the earth. In fact, it is the earth. It's, it's a pre-industrial way of building, uh, which has very got a high, very high labor component. I've just helped a, a, a colleague in, 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 in India build um, the biggest span that I know. He'll be releasing it soon. That's Sentil Kumar, who worked for Doshi. And um, I'm quite interested in his case that uh, he's almost getting back to the fact that ordinary people can actually do this. We've just forgotten the way to do it. 
So yes, and then what we'll do when we when we have the bigger discourse on this, we'll talk about how when I was invited by Grafton Architects to, as the curators to Venice, they asked me about to articulate the construct behind your work. And my son Robert grabbed me and said, Dad, they're not asking you for a product. They're grabbing you by the scruff of your neck as an architect and saying, what is the essence of your work? And we articulated, my son and I, that one body of work is reliant on the human body, which deals with axiality. It deals with the components of what is classical architecture. And it's fundamental to my work. And the other body is one that looks at nature and the maths in nature, which underpins the more organic work. But ironically, um, uh, it, 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 it still relies on the, on the anthropomorphism, which is there. But we'll expand on that when we give that workshop. And it needed yes. good curators to actually grab you intellectually and make you take, investigate your own transition, which was wonderful, which is what your PhD by design does, by the way. Yes, or was meant to do. So this was, yes, we, we, ha we had to put in a drawing of Mapungubwe. And, you know, it, it, it's this zigzag motion. And it really, it deals with this idea of going from landscape to architecture back to landscape again. And it's this very clearly uh, choreographed um, procession through architecture and landscape that are in a sense almost intertwined because actually you can walk over the building or you can walk through it and then there are moments where you could even uh, join the one route with the other route which is quite remarkable and then we this is actually the last slide uh, we're basically Just, go to China. Um, to say in China and other parts of the world, really extending his organic language and his new organic manner um, with very exciting projects. That we but also here, doing it with, a, with an equally crazy maverick client um, who everything you do, he wants to build. And he comes to my house and he takes photographs in my garden and says, must do in China. And I've had to teach him about that. It's, you don't copy you reinterpret and then you make it into something greater. So he's also become my pupil. And if he does things while I'm not in China that are not good, if I give him four out of 10, he demolishes it. He has to get at least six out of 10, not to demolish it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think I can stop sharing the screen because I, I think we're done. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Peter and Jonathan, for that <clears throat> insightful dialogue. More in the context of uh, an exchange uh, of ideas and practices between Africa and India. And we look forward to the workshop uh, next month. Uh, I would really open it to, we've had the privilege of uh, a dialogue before and even on the council platform. So I think we have, uh, I would really open it up to Professor Doshi, Rajiv and uh, Jeremy and several others who, who joined in to kind of uh, <clears throat> provoke the conversation. So. Thank you. Rajiv, would you like to respond or Jeremy, would you like to start off? Uh, yeah, yeah well, I, I can before I, um, it's very late here, before I fall asleep. <laughs> hey, uh, that was just, just wonderful. Hey, um, one of the... Um, uh, the land, uh, yes. connection is not so good, but I there must... What Peter is trying to do is quite amazing and remarkable. He's not here. We are able to hear.
No, no, go ahead and speak. I think you can speak. No, I don't think. Yeah, you can speak. Can you hear? Uh, yes, Nandan, we can hear. Can you hear, Doshi? Yeah. We can hear. We can hear. What I think one finds amazing about Peter's work is the kind of culture in which he is. And he's trying to combine many, many layers, you know, of designing a place. So it is about Peter. Hello, Peter, can you hear? I think we are having, but amazing work. We can hear. What experimentation, what scale? I, I can't I think, hear now. Uh, yeah. The, thing that I like about what Peter is doing and what he was, the writer was explaining is the kind of culture, attitude, environment, and in that you have to still discover something when you are in a place. Do you feel light about the place? Do you feel happy about the place? Do you really feel layers of spaces? And the tendency of the human body is to connect them and a dialogue begins. And I think, therefore, in Peter's areas, you are always induced in creating dialogues at different scales. And I think that is where the language comes in. That's where folklore comes in. And that's where, you know, our idea of lingering comes in. And I think that is quite remarkable. Unfortunately, we were not able to listen fully. But I think one should listen to him carefully again. And that would be wonderful. So I must congratulate him and also the writer for this. Thank you so much, Durga. Thank you, Professor Doshi. And... Uh for those <clears throat> observations and uh, your forward to the book as well. I think it's, it's an opportune moment to discuss the forward to the book, which kind of brought about these insights of how uh, Peter has been working in Africa. But also I think Peter's visit to India and conversations with India, this part has yeah. been conversations with Africa we hope to open up uh, conversations with India as well. And uh, thank you, Professor Doshi, for those insights. Durganda, if I just could say yeah. thank you to Doshi for his, his <clears throat> wonderful forward where he, he picked up on the drawing as, as a way of getting where you got. And a way is when you're in these, when you're in these positions of, of, of observing. And then, of course, you know, I've had the privilege of spending, my wife and I have spending 11 hours alone with Doshi on his lawn, one-to-one. -one. And that's changed my life. Because at a spiritual and other level, and just talking about life, not just architecture, it's, um, it's, it's put one in a, in a very, very good space to, 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 to relook and reevaluate. I just want to say that we also enjoyed your presence and the way you live, the way you drew, the way you saw things. Important thing that I find is fluidity. Fluidity okay. in which there is lightness and there is joy and there is a celebration. And I think that's what you are talking about. And that is what you see in Africa and in your work. And so I want to also take this opportunity because we are not meeting. But thank you so much Shai, for giving us this chance to have a look at what you're doing. Thank you so much, Peter. Wonderful. Thank you. Peter, if I can add, I mean, I was amazed. I mean, it's wonderful to go through your book, which I... I had the privilege of going through up uh, uh, those shared with me, 
but also I, I think uh, it's amazing that in the time that the world was looking towards the West, you opened up to what is local, what is culturally directly there. And you opened up so many avenues for young architects to open up and see things in a different way. That is amazing. I mean, I remember the first time I came and met you and you showed me things about Africa, which I, I mean, this was my first visit I knew nothing about. And I stayed with you. And I feel it has opened many doors. Thank you very much. What a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. It is really amazing. I've lost sound. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And also, we'll see you soon in India. I Thank you. You will be spending a couple of months. <laughs> I'd love to. <laughs> yeah, as promised. So I'm yes. so soon we will see you here in Ahmedabad. Thank yeah, you. you will. Thank you. I make the pilgrimage. <laughs> Thank you. Check out. Also. Nice that he was not in a rush. There was something. Nandan, I think I can. Yeah, this and you connected through some. <coughs> Rajiv, we can hear you because you, I think you're connected through another. Yes, because the, the computer, but anyway, the, the question that I had was that, Peter, I'm very curious to know that how did you transcend from what was the normal, the standard in the times of apartheid to, to something that you looked at the local and you discovered in that a power and a, and a connection to uh, something beyond and that sort of made it more, con not only just contextual, I think that's the wrong term, but it made it so much more rooted in its place. And then you discovered ways of building and the ways of putting things together in ways that I, I don't think um, a lot of uh, people in Africa have thought about. Peter, you're on mute. You would have to unmute, Peter. Yes, I've unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to answer the question. There were actually two things. One, um, uh, when I was 12, I, I severed my right hand and nearly lost the use of it. And the nerve grew down and gave me the use of my hand back when I was at high school. And so because of, to overcome that difficulty, I became an athlete. Okay, and I, I, I was a 400 meter hurdler. Why I tell the story is because I would have been chosen for two Olympics and probably would have made two finals. But I chose to support the sports boycott because ordinary white South Africans didn't understand the iniquities of apartheid. And so that taught me that there was a bigger issue than yourself that needed to be considered. That was one, it was an activist. And I had to make that sacrifice. I was ranked sixth in the world, so I would have made two Olympic finals. 
but really athletics taught me as an individual so many lessons that um, the other thing doesn't matter. But the other important thing is I realized as a young student in the middle of apartheid that um, the Anglophile Calvinist Christian Judaic viewpoint was a mindset that excluded everything that didn't fit it. So I contested that. And instead of becoming a political person who threw, who threw petrol bombs at the police, I went and lived with the indigenous people and learned from them. And then I now I have this legacy of having documented how they lived um, and then followed how they adapted to change as they were exposed to the iniquities of, of segregation. So I think those two questions actually, which have to do with activism, were what changed the mindset. Because, you know, South Africa was the eighth economy in the world. We now pay 15 to the dollar. It's not as bad as India, but we, we were eighth in the world. And when the gold price was up, everything was fine if you were white, but it wasn't fine if you were, if you were black. And also, it wasn't until 1980 that the colonial society we were in even acknowledged that we had Africans who did art or, 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 or had culture because they were so obsessed with their own colonial mindset. Now, if you're talking to Indians, they understand completely what that means. The British came here to take our gold and our diamonds. And we became briefcase carrying Englishmen. But I wanted to know our gardener and our, our, our maid, who we knew their first names, how did they live? How did they deal with issues of, 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 of um, sexuality? How did they deal with issues of uh, our religion? The Christian religion didn't seem to impose on them. It seemed to be accommodated quite easily and in a syncretic way, um, be benign. That was fine. But, but other than that, they, they were completely marginalized because they didn't suit the Anglophile mindset. So I contested that. And that's what we need to do in life. We need to contest, contest our situations. So I turned it into an advantage. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. That does, that does I mean, I think it sort of gives a background to how one moves on. And I think it'll be good for young minds to understand this. I think it's very, very significant what you talked about. Thank you. Durgand, any other questions? Uh, so you're on, you're on mute. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Rajiv, for that. Uh, and please do free, feel free to uh, intervene as we are progressing. Uh, Jeremy Smith is here from New Zealand and he's <clears throat> keen to also respond. And uh, so maybe Jeremy, you could come in with a perspective from New Zealand. I think Rajiv and what Professor Doshi were discussing in terms of the nuancing, understanding of a cultural practice and uh, I think it needs some more, it needs a deeper questioning on the directions because uh, the directions of the local versus the directions of what the modern project was bringing. And I think that conversation we could open next month in greater detail, you know, which we had not. Uh, and with Professor Doshi bringing this issue up, I think it, we could dwell on it a little more in the next month, you know, during the six sessions that we're going to have. So, Jeremy, would you like to intervene and give your point? Of view? Um, yeah, um, uh, it was just wonderful. Um, my, my little quick point is, is um, uh, when I read the book, I, is a, a generosity is a really important word in all this and in outward thinking. And um, I'd just be interested in, in Peter's talking a wee bit more about um, uh, yeah, sort of generosity in life in terms of giving back to people around you, um, not just that architecturally, but just, just personally. I mean, it's what we call in New Zealand Manaki Tanga, which is kind of having a welcoming outward spirit. Um, is that a question? <laughs> <laughs> Well, 
Well, I think we could have a discussion about generosity because me going to India has taught me gift exchange and taught me a generosity which I find very difficult to find elsewhere in the world, especially in architectural circles. So that's a whole other thing that we can actually talk about, the importance of generosity. And, um, and uh, so I think it's, uh, it, it, it is a question. Our, our profession is not a generous, generous profession, um, uh, certainly not in, in the South African context. But I've found generosity and, um, and you know, um, giving and receiving the receiving hand, the holding hand, and the giving hand. I found it in African culture, but it's been a bit buried. We're trying to un uncover it. But in India, and certainly with the architectural colleagues that I have, and Doshi, the idea, I think you can couple that with the idea of, of certainty and uncertainty. There are many philosophical ideas around this that we can, we can take further. Thank you. Jeremy, did that answer? Yeah, yeah, perfectly. <laughs> I know, but I think I think you can read. I, I think you can read in, in your work an outward thinking approach, which, um, which you know, which is which is wonderful, and that's and that's um, it, it, it's something that we all should learn from. Um, you know, particularly in the West. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the things that I found fascinating was the drawing that you had made with with your noses in it and the totems of the hands of receiving and giving, and and the way that uh, it's a fascinating drawing, and it sort of goes into the realms of fantasy at one stage, at one, one level, at the other level, it sort of connects to the ways that we connect to people all around us. And I, I find that uh, fascinating because I think that's something so true about the generosity of spirit that you bring to the conversation. Uh, uh, I, I, I really think that you need to speak more about that drawing because it has many more connotations than, than what you've just revealed in, in a short listing. I wish you, I would like you to speak a little bit more about it. Uh, now, or when we <laughs> meet in a few weeks time. <laughs> Look, I think we've got to pay homage to the heroes that we have in our lives. And one way of doing it is to, is to, is to go into that uh, mythological mode. Um, Jackson was this remarkable African um, who, um, at a point of committing suicide, had a visitation which turned him into the very religious person. But what's very interesting about Jackson, when you go into his, his um, narrative, which he carved on a hillside, he took a 2,000-year-old site, which was Iron Age. He said the stones were put there by God. And then on that hillside, he carved a narrative which had to do with the Christian narrative and all the binaries of up and down, beginning and end, good and evil, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But his Christianity goes further back. It goes right back to the Egyptians and it goes back to the Coptics. So it's not limited to the James Bible of the Englishman that came here. And, and it's also very important. He talks about it's so important to discover your calling in life and so much time of your life is spent working and you need to put energy into something that's creative. And he also spoke about jablus. He spoke about the devil being on your shoulder. Now, when you come to India and you meet Hindus and that, the devil isn't this burning fire that you go to. And when you're Christians, it's actually something that you even have gods that you talk to. So it made a lot of sense. And then we had certain we had uh, we had the death of vultures um, in the in 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 the, in the Kruger Park, and I took the vulture group to talk to the Shanghans because we heard that they had poisoned the vultures, and we found out from Jackson that yes, in times of uncertainty we poison the vulture because when we eat of its heart we get to see the future, 
Then he asked to make some, uh, Jackson asked if he could actually make some sculptures of vultures. And without any recourse to book, he made the five different vulture types in South Africa and a sixth one, which only occurs on an Egyptian hieroglyph. Now, how did he know that? He also told me to the day three years before that Mandela was going to be released. So when you meet these mythical um, shamans uh, in your life, and I have one of the best collections of his sculptures, and the sculptures are in the drawing. They float around our house, but I took them into the greater landscape and changed their scale. It talks about that he was sculpting a landscape and I was sculpting a landscape, and there was a symbiosis. So it's almost paying homage to that. And I could do, a, I will need to do similar ones of my visits to Doshi, my visits to, um, to, to India. I think these mythological drawings and landscapes that we do, especially when you make them spatial, they're just very rewarding to you because you, you go where the artist goes. You go where Le Corbusier went on those mornings he was in his studio. Um, and I realized, you know, Pancho Gerish used to say to me, how's your painting and how's your drawing? Because he knew if you were drawing, your architecture would be good. He never asked, how's the architecture? And I think it's, it's, it's something that we, that I certainly go into the sacred and go into a meditational state, regardless of which affinity I have to any, any, any of who's, who's, who's God and who's not God. I believe God is in nature. Um, and drawing is, is, is the thing that, that grounds me and puts me into balance. So I hope that answers your question. I just happen to use the religious narrative of, of, of Jackson, but also I've got the, the four-pointed star as an arrow going through space, which is one of his sculptures, and a lot of the symbolism goes right back to the Egyptians. And I'm, I'm intrigued when I go to the Ran of Kush, and we do we document a village, and I find the DNA in a house goes back 4,000 years. I'm intrigued by that. I hope that answers your question, Rashif. <laughs> Yes, yes, it does. It's an amazing connection. I mean, I relate to it in many, many, at many levels of what you're saying. Thank but you. But when I go to Nalanda with you, Thank I want you, to Peter. do a point of Nalanda. <laughs> Because it's already evoked, evoked a whole series of spatial experiences in my mind. I, I might do it before I go. It might be <laughs> wonderful. True. True. <laughs> that would be great. I can't hear the dialogue. Rajif, I can't hear any dialogue. Yeah. Uh, Nandan, I, I think you need to step in and if there are other people who have questions because... Sure. Hello. Hello. Nandan? Hello. Yeah. Yes. Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah. Can you hear me, Rajiv? Okay, thank you, uh, Rajiv, and thank you, Professor Doshi, for being here uh, with us today. I hope we can continue this dialogue. And yesterday I had the opportunity of speaking to Professor Doshi and I think we are open uh, <clears throat> for a dialogue at any time. And so that's an open invitation. We're always, I think, waiting for an occasion of that nature. And uh, so <clears throat> on that note, I would open it to the uh, others who are present here. I think we have uh, several from around the world who joined in. So there's, it's, it's an open dialogue. So if anybody else feels like responding, a thought or a, or a question, please, please. Uh... I think Ashwin wanted to talk earlier. Yes, if uh, Ashwin or... Uh... Is Ashwin there? Ashwin, would you like to... Uh... So just 
like to uh, add something that I've noted, uh, like through the presentation, and uh, just a comment, not a question or something like that. I felt what uh, architect Peter Rich deals with in the context of South Africa, and if I can extend it even to a global South perspective, that the context that he deals with are extremely uh, contested in terms of uh, culturally or politically. And uh, and the resolutions he comes up with, uh, the design is extremely sensitive. And the documentation that Professor Noble had done was uh, amazing. And the illustrations or uh, the drawings that has been presented here are of such a level that had a certain degree of uh, uh, sensitivity in terms of even phenomenologically. Uh, so I just wanted to commend uh, Professor Noble and the architect Peter Rich on that. And it was such an amazing presentation. Thank you for uh, presenting. And I hope to uh, work with you in the uh, coming studio with SCAD. It's fantastic. Um, Ashwin, are you, are you, you from SEPT? Yes, I'm from, I did my master's in SEPT. Yes, no, it's fantastic to have you and your colleague who were present yesterday um, at the school. I, I can't wait to be with you. Um, and uh, yes, the whole phenomenological thing is a whole, is a whole nother story. And you're quite right. I've also had to shift my perspective from realizing there's a whole Spanish world out there that's running the same races as us. And we can't let language be the block. Um, we need to embrace that. Okay. Thank you. And I regard I regard India as part of the global south. <laughs> I don't care what your geography is. You're part of the global south. <laughs> yeah. There are. And I say that with, I say that with 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 admiration and affection. Yeah. No, I feel that there are certain patterns that we can draw parallel upon, and especially when you're when uh, Professor Noble was actually talking about uh, the dirtiness in urbanity and uh, such that we as architects or designers we kind of tend to focus on a sort of hyper sterility in uh, uh, in our designs, but it is very necessary that we embrace the imperfections and dirtiness of uh, the design or the context itself so that was uh, actually that was very evocative that particular slide was very evocative in that sense well you you'll be pleased to know that you know uh, jonathan because he had a certain number of words uh, prescribed by the publisher that the book is not about my urbanism and housing and cities that's another book but I've started doing a whole series of drawings that are pulling all of that together. There's a publication that's coming out next week um, uh, in, 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 in Venice, in, uh, which is uh, curated by Tam Architecti, who won the, the Pritzker, won the um, Aga Khan Prize. And uh, uh, Simone, as the curator, spoke about shared intelligences and the shared intelligence he wanted me to share with him was African space making and I had four panels so I drew profusely and I can share those panels with you but what's happened is I recently been approached to see if I can get appointed to work with a with um, an NGO in Germany and England doing trying to solve the problem of 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 housing the poor in Namibia it's still in a bid stage, but if we win, and what I've done is the profile, I started putting together a lot of the work I've done in housing, and I suddenly find I have an exhibition that, you know, Nandan's never seen. So I'm going to work at that, and it can become a book, because the drawings are all there. So you flesh the drawings out, and then you actually start seeing how you actually trying to address these issues all the time of of people who've had their lives and culture smashed and they've been put in government grids and they're still trying to adjust and there's so little vestige of what they've got that they can cling to. But then we need to go to Mexico and we need to go to, um, to, to India because a lot of these people are first generation urban dwellers. They haven't been exposed to living in anything other than a single story. 
And we need to learn from you because, you know, in what took 150 years to happen with cities in the world is happening within 15 years in, in Africa with all the mistakes and some successes. So we have an incredible obligation. So I'm obliged now to put this book together where I, I take almost as a, a primer on African space making from the traditional going all the way through and even to squatter camps and how they adapt and what you can learn from it. And that'll be part of the dialogue I have with you when I return to India with all of you. Because I'll bring the drawings. We can just pin them up and then we can talk. Absolutely. Okay. I'm looking forward to that dialogue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, Therese would like to talk. She had raised her hand. Therese, would you like to? Hi, Pete. Hi, Donna. Um, great to hear your, your conversation. It's really inspiring as always, Pete, the drawings and your mind. Um, I just wanted to ask you, um, as you know, I'm very interested in intuition and how it works during the creative process. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Um, does it play a huge part in your creative process? And, and if so, do you, are you aware of when you're working intuitively? Um, some well, look, I didn't realize it when I went to school. I, I actually had a profound learning difficulty. I don't know whether dyslexia is the right word to describe it, but I had, I had, a, I had a serious learning difficulty. When I, at, when I was a school child, they didn't recognize those things. So I was just lucky that I had, uh, I drew. It was my dream state that I went into. So I became the guy who drew um, beautiful drawings on the board that could be part of the lesson during break time. And um, drawing was my solace, okay? And then I had my son, Robert, who had the same disorder, okay? And um, had difficulty with a second language, et cetera. And, he, and we both overcome that and actually realized that the whatever our learning difficulty was, it gave us a profoundly... Ad advantageous um, way of, of perceiving space and other things which were probably more acute than normal people. So yes, you know, when, when Johanny Palazma confirmed that 90 to 95% of what we do is intuitive, I mean, I get all my messages in that time between where you first wake and when you actually wake. That's where I structure my arguments. That's where I get all the, the things and, um, and, in, and in a meditative state, I had a father who was also very um, psychic, and um, and um, I suppose I'm a bit superstitious in that sort of way, but in a but in a very benign, nice way. It's all it's all got to do with the good. I don't indul indulge in philosophy that hasn't got to do with the good. So I believe implicitly behind all of this, it's actually the intuit. It's understanding the power of your intuition and using it as an enabling tool to just be free. Absolutely, you know, and Thank you've only you. got to look. You only got to look yesterday at Rajiv's presentation. You know, we took you through the process of how they had very limited time to do a competition they won for one of the great buildings of, of India now, which was a university, and how in that short space of time where you do we do the competition, don't you do it? You come across one or two things that just click it together, which you then run with. And I mean, where does that idea that you put on the back of a of a, I remember Todd Williams and Billy Tsing saying when they were commissioned to do that beautiful center for intuition um, uh, behind the, uh, in, in La Jolla, behind the famous building of Cairns, um, uh, they had a discussion and then they had a cup of coffee and then they drew, they drew, it, they drew the idea on the back of a cigarette box. Yeah. And the person who was going to do this, the center was intrigued by how did that happen? And there's the building. <laughs> so yes, um, it's 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 central to to the way I work creatively, and the way certainly my son Robert works creatively, and um, and most architects that I admire. Yeah. And Pete, um, your relationship with Jackson Shungwane and and the, the 
um, artworks you've been referring to now. Where can we read more about that? Um, are you going to write a book about that? Or well, there's, a, a there's, about there's that? a book being published on Jackson because we've just done an exhibition and there's I've got about 17 anecdotes in it. But mm -hmm. it, Jackson, I was doing a project up at Elam. I was doing a, I was doing a project up at Elam, and I, so I went every two weeks for a period of two years, and then I discovered Jackson, and I became his custodian, mm. because the art world discovered him, and they wanted to come up this hill and own his work, and he found it a bit bewildering. He made it for, he had instant shoe shine pieces they could take. But then he had works that had to spread the message and he had works that were significantly part of why he had built an Acropolis. Like, and then suddenly the art world. So I acted as a mediator. If works were going to get sold, I made sure they so um, it, it, it was uh, it was it was a, it was a wonderful relationship with him as a custodian. So mm -hmm. it was different. And the works I've got are autobiographical. I bought them from him. OK. And um, but I developed a relationship with him over time. And when I introduced him to Pancho, they were like kindred spirits. I mean, they just unbelievable because you could see where both of them came from. Mm. And both of them believe that the more you design, the more you draw, the better you get at what you're doing. OK. And they also believed in being diversely creative. You know, Pancho mm. used to say, become a filmmaker, do drawings, do sculpture and architecture. Your architecture will be better. Yep. So it's that yep. multivalent thing that happens. Yeah. I tend to agree with that. I tend to agree with that. But uh, so all the more reason for you to write a book about your relationship with him. Yeah, no, for sure. At least jot down some notes for us. Okay. But <laughs> it, it, part of it is in the book being done by Nessa Liebhammer, which, we're, which, which we're trying to get funding to publish. So that, that there's true? a definitive work. For, for, for definitive book on his work, which will accompany the exhibition that's now in Cape Town at the okay. Normal Gallery. Cool. Yeah. 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 Okay, thanks, Keith. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Would, would Fiona, if she's there, or Bhumika, would you like to ask a question? Bhumika? Good evening, sir. Thank you, Jonathan and Peter, for amazing presentation. Uh, my question is for Peter. Like you mentioned, the Alexander Heritage Center could have the opportunity and potential to grow into uh, the settlement and eventually contribute to the urban housing. Could you elaborate more on how architecture contributes to the society? over a period of time beyond just a building, but influence such a complex grain of culture to grow more and beyond? At the moment we're battling, it's a good question. At the moment we're battling with um, the building and Alex because the government have gone and put the wrong people in charge of the building. So although you have all the good intentions of it serving the community, it doesn't. We've got a committee in place where we're saying to the city, if you can tell us, again, this is to do with agency and being active, being an active person as an architect. If you can give us, tell us who owns the building, we think it's the city or the mayor and owns the site, and they can sanction the formation of a community trust, we can have, a, uh, we can have an executive committee from the community who are not paid, but they can access through a leading legal firm corporates that can fund all of the wonderful activities that can take place with the existing building. And then we've got a woman who's very powerful. She used to be the head of police and she's now the chair of chairs. And she's saying, I think this shouldn't just be a heritage facility. I think it should be the arts. I think it should teach debate because African children are not taught to contest or to um, arguments. And she said she learned what she learned through debating. And I think it needs to, to embrace music and other things. Now, once we get the community trust in place, it can then grow these other arms, which hopefully will be funded by the government. And then we can say there's a potential for a new urbanism here because we can actually um, create this movement system that happens at first floor level above the shacks. And then there can be, there can be a new four-story walk-up um, where we can accommodate the, the 500 people in shacks in, in really good housing that, that are east-west orientated. 
and maybe the housing can be a system of structured floors, but I'd like to bring Salvador Reda, Nandan, leading people from around the world to have a workshop where we, we, we conduct this for a week from the center, and maybe I can get the... Um, I can get our brick company to actually sponsor it, where we address the idea of a new urbanism for a place like Alexander, which is shacks, but it's so strategically placed with valuable land and ownership of land hasn't been transferred yet. So I think it's a unique opportunity to use it as a catalyst to think differently about what that environment can be. And then just the ideas of courtyards with 10 families, it's such a beautiful idea. It used to exist in Muslim societies here, but it's been eradicated now. Okay, so you bring again learning from the past, but to the new urbanism, and you know, and maybe you can create a steel structure where, provided you've got floors and service ducts, the people can make their own housing. The squatters. Let's take all these ideas that are current and see if we can't apply. Okay. Thank you. Does that it answer your very, question? Yeah, it did answer my question. It was very beautiful, like how you said it. It behaves as a catalyst, as if you're seeding something and from there it grows beyond the building. Well, it's also a building that's not about form. You know, you can you can almost weld informal sector canopies onto it, but also it can grow additional arms over the existing housing. And actually, those can be the internet cafes, they can be the libraries, they can be the art venues. Um, I've actually started doing a work while we have a recess in the office to see practically how that could work. Um, but I think it, it needs a workshop of a whole lot of other minds, especially from Latin America and the Spanish speaking world and your world, the developing world. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That answered my question. Thank you. Thank you. Fiona, would you like to? Sure. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Fiona. Uh, so uh, the presentation was very thought provoking. I currently don't have a question or a commentary because it was so thought provoking that I have so many thoughts and uh, I'm yet to like, you know, gather them and articulate them uh, because it was uh, about so many different things and uh, so many different issues and looking at them of uh, all of the looking at all of them as design issues and where uh, I felt throughout the presentation it was all about uh, uh, you know getting to the root cause of uh, everything and then trying to you know provide a solution so I think that was a very thought-provoking I'm still uh, gathering all of my thoughts together nevertheless um, I, I was quite intrigued by uh, the global south um, a term that you had uh, that we were talking about um, and the so the far past one year I have been involved in the global south and studying okay trying to define global south looking at different maps so I just I mean it's it is out of topic but um, uh, I would like to um, uh, ask you this question about what what are basically the criteria or uh, parameters that you would say to call a place global south like we we tend to call an entire country global south but there are souths in the north and norths in the south so uh, with all of that being said like how can you can you we term like except geographically no saying okay this is definitely global south then does china come under global south according to you because i know it's a, it's quite a subjective uh, thing going on. So it's only out of curiosity. Well, I think the first thing is it has to do with the value of money, which defines the developed world. Yeah. Because when you talk about sustainability and you in the developed world, which has got a cold climate for part of the year, um, and uh, the value of money has led to very high embodied energy, and then relatively with lead and other programs of how you can perhaps marginally reduce that huge amount of energy you use. Mm. Whereas in, 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 in a context where the, the, um, the money isn't as valuable, 
you know, whether you're in Bangladesh or whether you're in Latin America or whether you're in Africa, um, or it depends which part of Africa, because some parts of Africa and East Africa are as expensive as Europe, um, you, um, you can actually just labor. You know, sometimes the reason you're doing a project is actually to create, is to give labor a chance to work. <laughs> you know, it's completely different. When I worked in Chicago, we had a minimum wage of $150 an hour for labor. Um, I mean, I don't earn that as an architect if you do the conversion. Um, and and uh, so we had to find a way of working on a farm and bringing things in between two hours in the morning so we didn't have to work through the unions, okay, to do something that, because the client wanted an architecture that you could taste, smell, and touch, and, and it was made out of the earth. So Americans didn't know how to do that because they haven't done it for so long, they don't know how to do it. Um, and it's what I'm trying to say to, to, to Indian students, you know, and, and you know, always admire the work of Sankalpa at SEPT, where you actually take craft and you actually say, well, just let's not teach it as, let's just not look at it as a material object, look at it, how we can use it in another meaningful way. And that's what the world's wanting to learn from you in India, you know, because you, 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 we almost have an obligation to give work. A lot of my projects are, are, are funded by government agencies that insist that a certain percentage of your workforce has to be unemployed labor across gender and age mm. that are trained to do something. It, 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 it presents a managerial problem to the normal contractor, but mm. it's a reality we've had to embrace. Okay. And, um, you know, that's why, that's where we have, a. so it's, it, it's not really, and then you've got the greater number of people living in the South. Okay. But then you've got this huge, you know, that I just regard India as part of that. It's not, it's not a South North thing. Okay. Um, uh, for India, the North becomes North of the Himalayas to me. It, 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 it I regard you, uh, you as, you as, as much a part of what's happening in South America as we are, because you're running the same races. Because you've got this incredible disparity economically within your society, you've got the same complexities of 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 different ethnicities and belief systems, and uh, and therefore we a lot of us are running the same race. So that's how I deal with. I don't get caught up in the in the in the in the, in the, in the definitive arg argument of global south and yeah. north. And I've got Australian colleagues who talk to me about global south, and I said, come on, you know. When I give lectures in Australia, students want to strip off naked and jump into mud because they, they're so hungry for natural materials because they have mm. all this high embodied material. They become like Americans because their money's so powerful. Mm. So they live in this Gucci world. That's their problem. It's not our problem. <laughs> so from what is... <laughs> So what you said about learning from India, I think even in Africa, I, I mean, first of all, it's wrong to say Africa as one complete thing because it's such a huge place and it's different. Um, I mean, the size of it is just so huge to comprehend. People usually uh, think of Africa as one together. It's a continent in itself. But I do think like Francis Kere's work and all of that, you know, with Earth and how they're involving entire villages to... Um, build together i think uh, it is more or less i mean it's quite easy to draw parallels between uh, how indian architecture contemporary is going on and after independence uh, how africa is also you know kind of because there's a 20 year two decade gap between the both to collectively see uh, in the global south like the last few countries to get uh, you know decolonized was uh, in africa so in that sense i think um, Africa still has a chance to draw parallels from the other colonized countries and then, you know, now sort of include those strategies to develop, uh, learn from history and project it to future, like you said. <laughs> well, we hope so. And, you know, there are different paradigms. I mean, you know, Francis Kerry operates out of Berlin because hmm. he has yeah. to earn euros and he has to have German backup to be mm. able to do what he can do effectively sure. where he does it, which is mm. different to the difficulty of actually working in Africa. So it, it's a question of seeking agency. Okay, sure. I'm not critical of that. 
yeah. then you also do get a lot of NGOs who do, you know, get get people's wealthy people's money or institutions and do little jewels in Africa as part of, of, of their contribution. That's another way of doing it. But you are getting people now from Europe who are actually moving into the African context and operating within that, either with international connections or other. But there's a lead, there's a there's a need for a lot of guidance. I'm on an advisory board. Um, I'm the vice chairman to Professor Paul Collier of Oxford, who's the leading economist on African cities to the city of Kigali. And it's been a big education tool for me because African cities are in a huge mess. They they sort of this colonial thing that grew and they shifted and they they've just got stuck and infrastructures, you know, and yet they're growing. And, you know, Indians who lived in the in, in East Africa are being resuscitated with land and mm -hmm. historical things are being pulled down and there's just this there's just this almost chaos that's going on. So we continue to do best practice within that. Um, I won a, I was part of a leading consortium bid to win a competition for a green city in Kigali with a leading um, a Sterling Prize awarding London firm, and we played a central role in in winning it. But we're hoping we're waiting for it to get built. It's caught up in politics. So yes, you can do best practice, but you actually want to build. And as I am at the moment, I've spent the last nine months at my own expense trying to build an NGO called Ignite Ubuntu. Ubuntu means we can do more together than we can do as an individual. It's a wonderful concept that Africans used to have. But I need to get funding and I need to overcome because we've got to transform traditional leadership in order to get people who've been abused politically to come to the table so you can enable them. So you run this whole other journey um, as an agency activist in order to do some architecture. But you've got to do it. Somebody's got to do it. It's not easy, but uh, we know we're not going to give up. <laughs> 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 thank you thank you thank you jonathan also it was a very nice ex presentation thank you so we we run through a full two hours uh and uh maybe i need to bring back the context of the fact that uh in the next month, and we we'll announce it, uh, that this dialogue between uh, <clears throat> a search in Africa with, with maybe a resonating search in India uh, would kind of maybe broaden the context. So it we in the four, the structures that you created, you know, the four structures, Jonathan, that you created would become the backbone and maybe over the next month or so before it begins, uh, we could nuance it further, look at other aspects of it, uh, look at drawings, look at uh, the social context, because I think understanding the larger context may also be essential here rather than just uh, linking with the architecture or the architectural manifestation, you know, the, whether it's a remote the remote indigenous villages or uh, so I think if we can evolve something of that nature, uh, then we would, we would open it up to all the schools. And uh, right now, I would say the Savita College of Architecture has got acknowledged as a center of the Southeast. There are many uh, <clears throat> schools now from Southeast Asia and Malaysia and few of them, I see them have uh, logged into the program today and they've been in conversation with us at the level of the deans to kind of collaborate with the Savita College and looking at a larger uh, firmament you know so I think we can broaden it to include uh, at least five schools from Southeast Asia three of them are here I think I do see them here they were here some time back so three of them are here. If they wish to speak, would be good, but uh, it's quite late for them. I think we'll we'll broaden it and then connect all of us together and maybe have another.
conversation when when they are when they are all to, they are here. Winchi, would you like to talk or uh, she's from Malaysia? Are you still logged in? I can see you logged in. Would you like to talk? So for four of the Malaysian schools have logged in, but maybe they're, uh, it's quite late in Malaysia as well. So I think we can expand the program to kind of uh, look into this. And thank you, Peter. I, uh, I think that <clears throat> actually the conversation between Jonathan and Peter in bringing up uh, not just the manifestations, but uh, also bringing up the root causes that kind of provoke these manifestations. So if it can be at both levels, the ideation, the root inspiration, and, and the uh, expression, I think as, as a kind of a unfolding process, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think the Malaysian architects are saying that their line is uh, lagging. It's fine. I think we'll try and organize another conversation with the schools in Malaysia who've logged in. But I think if this program uh, unfolds and then resonates with what are the similarities or between uh, Africa and India. And uh, the similarities could be at one level generic and another level specific also. So what happens is we have dual levels of discussion. It doesn't try to generalize everything. It, uh, it looks at local context, which may be very di diverse. It may not be you know, not easy to generalize uh, because our rural studio has just begun in Savita. We've just begun it. The students are coming down. And so we've begun and we've had the first few interventions into the rural studio. Uh, along with it, we would probably be connecting with Oroville and Laurie Baker Center and a few others who've been working in the rural context in India. So I think if we can build it up and Sendil's promise to come over to the campus in September. So I think if Sendil also comes over, then uh, Sendil would be there. If possible, we attempt some kind of a construction on the campus, if it's possible, uh, while the online dialogue is on. So it doesn't remain only an online dialogue. It, it has uh, within our campus or in India an act of construction. Because right now, what we've been doing is if the second year takes on a rural studio, the culmination has to be uh, in some kind of intervention or engagement, not just an academic project. So it could be a design build kind of a semester. So I think this may overlay with that design build. And there are almost 25 schools in India and five schools in Southeast Asia who already uh, shown their inclination to collaborate with us on this front. You know? So if it's okay, then uh, I think we can close for today. And uh, what we've discussed would be transcribed and the transcription will be sent over to you, Jonathan, so we can have a look at it and put it together. We would also hopefully try to edit this video. So it becomes a kind of a generic video, which is uploaded. So those who are keen, to kind of understand more about the workshop that we're going to organize, get a sense of it, right from the context to the materiality, to its expression, to its social inhabitation. And I think- so Ganant, um, the yes, we, we couldn't hear what Doshi and Rajiv were saying. Is no, what somebody, I'm have, to... a, somebody it, have a recording? It was, not, it was not clear. I've just spoken to uh, Rajiv, actually texted him. Uh, tomorrow, maybe we'll have a separate talk over the phone I'll, and I'll request Doshi be recorded because uh, and then maybe send it over or overlay it on this video, something like that we need to do uh, because then then there would be a completion to this dialogue you know, because uh, Thank you. Uh, the, 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 the video quality was not very strong at that time. So I think we, we probably will do that. And uh, I think Professor Before you conclude, I just want to thank you for giving Jonathan the chance as the amazing wizard, who, an alchemist who chose to study my work, a chance for him to speak um, as, the, as the author who, 
you know, who, who did the inquiry. I mean, it's amazing. So I think it was nice that this pre preempted us giving the series of lectures. I think it was a very nice gesture on your part. Thank you so much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Jonathan. And I think let's continue this further. And as we close, this is the penultimate, this is the final one. I would like to place on record the complete support we got from our faculty uh, working day and night. So there was Priyanka leading it. Then there was uh, Fiona and Ashwin, Sri Venkatesh, Sandhya, Vigna Lakshmi, uh, Dr. Jyoti Lakshmi, <clears throat> and the artist. And I think we will, we will have a larger collaborative studio. Uh, we have three more faculty joining in. And uh, I think what, what is evolving right now is, is a dialogical space. And uh, I thank the architects who have been supporting the space. Otherwise, a young school, you know, to nurture a young school, right from Professor Doshi, uh, who was, who's there. In fact, Professor Doshi has even taken the liberty to come into our history class. And so something that we were doing in the 80s, uh, we were there and today it becomes history. So it's very strange to sit in that kind of a zone. So when we're teaching, I am Bangalore or in history, we have Professor Doshi himself at times describing coming in. And I think that's a very rare uh, <clears throat> moment for us. And I, I, since we're closing, I'd like to place on record the generosity, of course, Jeremy Smith, who has come into our studio several times and uh, we would invite him further, uh, has been there with us and a whole range of students as well as schools of architecture from the Southeast Asia. So I think uh, if we kind of can create a gradual network of conversation like this, which, which uh, resonates several uh, levels of meaning, discourse, but move it into something actionable. So it doesn't remain at this course. It has to move into actionable either in the city as policy, in the villages as policy, or actual construction. You know, I think that's, that's our goal. And these talks are going into various studios as well after they're transcribed. So I need to place on record uh, the support that we've got from the Council of Architecture. Uh, the president uh, took time out of a very, very busy schedule yesterday and made a presentation to inaugurate this uh, uh, design forum. And that was a gesture of the council supporting uh, what we were doing here on our campus. So I think I'd like to, because that's, that's what has allowed us the reach to more than 20 or 25 schools within uh, India, because I think the conversation is broadening. So thank you, Peter, again, and thank you, Jonathan. I thank the faculty again. And on that note, let's close for a happy weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank My you. wife's gone away, so I'm going to India town to have a palak paneer and a vegetable curry. <laughs> maybe, she's, <laughs> maybe she's logged in and hearing, but that's fine. So <laughs> let's... <laughs> Enjoy the palak paneer, but I think we then need you in India to enjoy the authentic palak paneer here. And let's, Peter, let's really plan with Jonathan whether December or January is possible if uh, we can start thinking about it. Maybe we, I think February would be safer. So from the vaccination point, maybe we can start discussing that, you know, and, and look at a, because I think several, I think flights have begun. So there is an easing. So let's start discussing and prepare ourselves. Then if it, uh, and see how the context happens. Yeah, we'd like you in India and Sendil's promise to support the studio when you're down here in India. The council has uh, promised to make it a national seminar. So I think from the council platform, it becomes a national seminar and we unfold from there. So thank you again, Peter. And uh, thank you, John. Pleasure. Thank you.